Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor for me and a pleasure as well to introduce William McNeil in this series of lectures by distinguished American guests. Perhaps you, at least some of you, I'm certain, have seen the film that was shown on television on Tuesday night. And in that case, you have already been able to form yourself an impression of the lively personality of Professor McNeil and of the way he talks about his own work. If you missed the film, you can make up for it, for it will be repeated on December 29 at 11.30 a.m. It's something to look forward to, I think, for the dark days after Christmas. The film is very good, and it gives a vivid impression of William McNeil. But of course, we have something much better in store for you, William McNeil mm -hmm. himself, in person. But before he appears to take the floor, I have been asked to introduce him. And you may well ask, why? Why should William McNeil, famous world historian, laureate of the Erasmus Prize in 1996, need an introduction, and then an introduction by a sociologist? So let me explain a little about my own relationship with William McNeil and his work. I am a sociologist. The word sociology was coined in the beginning of the 19th century by a French intellectual named Auguste Comte. And according to him, sociology should be the scientific study of human society. As such, it should consist of two branches, which he called social statics and social dynamics. Interpreted somewhat freely, one could say that social statics, in the way Kant conceived it, is about society as it is, how it is structured, how it functions, what are the main institutional arrangements and the recurrent patterns, it's social statics. Social dynamics should be about how society has become the way it is. When we look at humanity today, we see that it is divided along all sorts of different lines. We have different states, different nations, different religions, different languages, different castes, different social classes, and so on. And all these social and cultural divisions, of course, have not always been the way they are today. Similarly, today's industrial societies have developed out of earlier agrarian societies. And again, those agrarian societies have developed out of earlier societies of gatherers and hunters. So when we consider human society not in static but in dynamic terms, we add a time dimension to sociology. And at the same time, it also becomes impossible to conceive of societies as single units consisting of separate states or nations. We perceive human society at large as a single configuration of many sorts of intertwining social relationships. And that is where sociology meets history, and not just history, but world history. Now let me say something more personal about how I became acquainted with the work of William McNeil. There are several ways of entering into his work, so to speak. One is to follow what you might call the royal road. That is, to begin by reading his major work, The Rise of the West, A History of the Human Community. 
and from there on to proceed to read the many other books he has written, each of which is in one way or another a side branch of that major trunk, The Rise of the West. Well, I think you already feel it coming. I have to admit that this was not the way I became familiar with McNeil's work. I came in through a side entrance, I think the most popular side entrance, by reading Plagues and Peoples. It's about 20 years ago, I think, that I read a review of that book. It had just appeared in the New York Review of Books. And I immediately felt this is a book that I must read. And I can tell you I was not disappointed. This was a book about human history in the true sense of the word, spanning the whole globe and connecting the history of mankind with the history of other human, or with other beings with which we share life on this planet. Like all other animals, we human beings, in order to survive and to reproduce ourselves, have to see to two things, that we can eat and that we shall not be eaten by others. And the addition of this second clause, that we shall not be eaten, you could also for reformulate it as a commandment, thou shall not be eaten. But this second clause forms, in my opinion, an obvious and necessary completion to the theory of historical materialism. And it had been badly neglected by most of those who called themselves historical materialists. Karl Marx and the Marxists emphasized the need to eat. They showed how societies are organized around the relationships of production, with forms of exploitation arising out of the control over the means of production. McNeil has shown that no less important than the forces of production are the forces of destruction. Humans have always found themselves surrounded by other forms of life, some of which could serve as food for humans, fortunately, while many others, large and small, would rather feed on us. I shall not give you a further summary of Plagues and Peoples. It is a rich and fascinating book, original and true, which, as you know, is a rare combination. It's not difficult to find books which are true but not very original, and to find sometimes books that are original but not very true. But here, Plagues and Peoples really has this rare combination. I'm sure quite a few of you have read it. If not, I advise you to do so soon, perhaps also in those dark days after Christmas. And if you do, you will be following the example of hundreds of thousands of others. And you will enter the edifice of McNeil's work through that marvelous side door. However, we should not forget that it is a side door, as are all those other wonderful books that he has written, such as The Pursuit of Power, about the role of war, military technology, and the arms trade in human history, and his most recent book, Keeping Together in Time, on, again, a highly original subject, the importance of dance and drill in human history. Still, the book that continues to hold the central place in McNeil's work is The Rise of the West. Again, a summary is impossible. It contains more than 800 tightly written pages, densely written, viewing human history from one consistent perspective. It is a book of tremendous learning, filled with intriguing facts. But it owes its success as an intellectual achievement not only to this massive learning, but at least as much to the fact that the author 
has managed to find an organizing principle that has turned out to work extremely well, that has helped him to organize his material. I think he will have to say something about that organizing principle in his lecture, so I shall say no more about it here. Let me suffice with one comment. Two days ago, in a discussion, Professor McNeil summed up the major theme of the rise of the West in very few words by saying that it was about the accretion of human power, the increase of human power. And some participant in the discussion took this to imply that McNeil represents what they called a benevolent view of history. And this is an opinion that is heard more often, and I think it is wrong. Power certainly is a two-edged thing, and it is certainly not something to be valued only in a positive way. As you know, it's often even treated as a dirty word. And it can be used, power, that is also not to be denied, to some people's advantage, but also to other people's disadvantage. And moreover, people who have some power are very often capable of making dreadful mistakes in what they see as their own advantage. But let me not anticipate upon the discussion. And certainly let me not try to voice Professor McNeil's opinions for him. For there is at least one person in this audience who can do that much better. The title of Professor McNeil's talk, as you know, is Reshaping the Human Past. And this will enable him to take in his stride both history, as it actually happened, and historiography, as it has been written. And I'm sure that he will sprinkle his lecture with many details from his own autobiography. Professor McNeil, may I ask you to take the floor? Listening to uh, Professor Hodsblum, I thought maybe he should be the one to give the lecture this evening. I prepared this lecture at the uh, invitation and instruction, really, of the representatives of the foundation to, I suppose, help to justify the award of the Erasmus Prize to me yesterday. So it is what I prepared, proposed to say is shaped very much around my own encounter with the human past as a student and teacher across now, I guess, rather more than 50 years. And I propose to speak first from notes, and then at the end I will read the prepared text because it's more concisely and exactly stated than I would do if I improvised. Academic history, as it, when it entered the university system of the Western world, of the European world, was shaped around, or came to be shaped around, predominantly shaped around, what I like to call a liberal vision of the past, what mattered in history. Shaped, at least in the English-speaking world, decisively by Lord Acton <clears throat> at the end of the 19th century when he reversed the traditional English view of the French Revolution, it's a terrible outbreak of violence and savagery, by declaring that no, the French Revolution was in fact one of the steps in the advance of liberty and that liberty was what mattered in history that it was a record of the human achievements of liberty that, that, that what ma was important, the, what you should pay attention to. Now this is, CERN was derived partly at least, or very largely, from the heritage of the ancient world, where persons beginning with Herodotus and Livy and Tacitus, those three in particular, had it stated exactly the same thing, that what, the, the seat of all human greatness the secret of it is liberty, 
because liberty permits free men to cooperate effectively, and what they meant primarily was to cooperate effectively in war, and thus achieve greatness. And when modern study of medieval and modern history became an academic subject, primarily, initially mainly in Germany, this classical heritage of what history is about was near the surface, and in the uh, European world, it meant that liberty again, freedom, the liberal branch of the German establishment, not everybody in Germany was a liberal, and then in France and England, uh, this way of seeing the past, what matters in our past is how we got to be as free and as powerful as we are. And freedom was the secret to power, to greatness. And this means that what mattered in history was first of all the, here, the story of ancient Greece and Rome and how freedom was, snuff, was snuffed out first in Greece and then in Rome by a imperial tyranny and then the refreshment of human liberty by the barbarian invasions in the West, the uh, in import of the seed of parliamentary government in the forms of popular assemblies in the German forests, the uh, re refreshment of this with Renaissance and then Reformation, the English Revolution, parliamentary supremacy coming finally to the fore, the French Revolution, liberty, equality, fraternity, and then the triumphs of liberal government and society in the 19th century. And as for the rest of the world, well, liberty didn't grow there. Liberty was not at home in Asia. Liber Asia was a land of tyranny. And therefore, while they had a history in the sense that things happened there, it was trivial history, it was meaningless history. They only joined the mainstream of history when the Europeans discovered them, ex established relationships with them, conquered them, and brought them into the school of liberty, at least this was the optimistic theory, that they too someday might join it, but not yet. Now this was the, the style of European and world history to which I was apprenticed as a young undergraduate, in high school first and then in college. But there was one enormous obstacle to its plausibility because I was born in the last years of the First World War, and in the 20s and 30s, when I was beginning to study, there was the memory of four years in the trenches, which was a contradiction of practically everything the liberal faith uh, valued. And what did you do about that? If the upshot of liberty in this glorified sense is the four years of uh, misery and bloodshed. And my teachers solved this by neglecting it. History stopped in August of 1914 with a very lively debate over war, war guilt, who, who, who was responsible for starting the war. And uh, they inherited a pattern of, a of distribution of attention throughout the record of the past and the implicit valuation of liberty that was in this, these choices of where to, what to concentrate upon I think if I, try, if I try to reconstruct their states of mind accurately without being truly aware of why things were distributed the way they were. Why, for example, you paid no attention to anything happening in Europe east of the uh, Vistula, uh, except when Russian armies intervened in the wars of the French Revolution of the 18th century in the, in the wars of the French Revolution. Um, there were plenty of questions to argue about, plenty of outstanding uh, debates within historiography. And when you started, when I started to become an historian, the way it was done was uh, hands-on apprentice training. Uh, you started to be an historian by taking a subject for a seminar and reading as much as you could about what other people had said and perhaps a few primary sources and then coming out with some wisdom of your own. It was a completely artisan tradition of apprenticeship uh, and the discussion of theoretical issues was almost nil and what there was was extremely naive, at least it looks to me now in retrospect. But there was lots to learn and I was quite unconscious of what now seemed to me glaring defects in this inherited portrait 
of the meaningful human past. Amongst the undergraduates when I was young, there were debates over other subjects, particularly over the Soviet Union. Was this the next stage of freedom in which freedom was extended to economic relations, economic equality, or was it a new tyranny as the treason trials of the 1930s suggested to some? And this was a very lively debate indeed, but conducted with full ignorance of Russian reality, uh, the more dogmatic for that. And then, uh, without entirely deciding what the meaning of the communist movement was, the shadow of advancing World War II became closer with the collisions between the United States and Japan and Germany. And then you had another kind of challenge to this liberal vision of the world emerging because it seemed more and more apparent that another war was coming. And it was coming in spite of the will and wishes of almost all engaged. Even the German public wasn't keen on the Second World War. And yet something in the geography, geometry of power was compelling the peoples of Europe and the United States as a side, as a onlooker, but at least in the circles I moved in, everyone believed the United States would get into the war if it, if it did start. Something that was going to reenact the kinds of struggles of the ancient Greek states, the Peloponnesian War, as recorded by Thucydides, the Punic Wars, as partially rec recorded by Polybius, and, uh, by, yes, Polybius and others. A process was at work, somehow, that looked to be above and beyond human will. And one of the memories I have of those days is one of my teachers took a speech in Thucydides and by substituting Britain for Athens and Germany for Sparta, published an editorial on the politics, the, the, the diplomacy of the preceding week. This was in The Nation, a journal of opinion in the United States. It was, made perfect sense, an accurate translation, just substituting those two words. And it was a comment upon what had happened the week before that seemed to have perfect relevance. Now that is uncanny. We're doing it over again. Something that happened before is now happening amongst us without our wanting it, without our willing it. It's a process in which we find ourselves caught. Now this experience prepared me for what I think still was the most pregnant encounter of my life intellectually in 1940 when I was a graduate student. I had more, more free time than I'd ever had since or before. I saw three greenback books in the library of Cornell University, which labeled with a label on the back, A Study of History, by someone called A.J. Toynbee, of whom I had never heard. And because they were nice, crisp, new volumes, I thought, pulled them off the shelf to see what a study of history might be. And found myself entranced by what he had to say parallel patterns of the breakdowns of civilizations in the plural. Because he too, in the First World War, had had this experience of uncanny repetition of the patterns of the ancient world. And he looked for parallels to 432 when the Peloponnesian War began and 218 when the Second Punic War began and 1914, which he had lived through in the historic record as available to him and found not just in the ancient world and the modern world, but in other civilizations, China, India, and the rest of them, parallel developments, a growth up to the point where paralyzing war, devastating war broke out, what he called civilized breakdown. And um, at that, that, this had two effects. First of all, it was taking what happened in 1914 seriously, trying to come to terms with it, as my teachers had refused to do. And secondly, it was expanding the revision of what history is about beyond the relatively narrow avenue of the classical and medieval and modern European past. Many other peoples, of course I'd known they had a history. Everybody knew they had a history, but they weren't part of history. They weren't part of meaningful history, as it was taught to me in my undergraduate days. <clears throat> 
So this enormous sense of the enlargement of the scale and variety and greatness of the human past, all reduced at the same time to an intelligible frame that took that sense of uncanny repetition of what others have experienced before us very much to heart. A change of view, a challenge to that which I had always assumed without thinking very much up to that time, including that four-fifths of humanity that had been left out of other history as previously taught and explored by me. It also meant that a single person could hope to comprehend the whole human past and bring it to some sort of intelligible form. A model for my own still quite tentative but ambitious ideas of understanding the history of the world around me. But even from the beginning, there were discrepancies between that which Toynbee had to say and my own angle of vision upon human society and interaction. Because I had taken a course from an anthropologist by the name of Robert Redfield, who uh, told me uh, whose idea people had patterned cultures. And when a patterned culture collided or encountered strangers, outsiders, the pattern was torn and stretched and might even be broken. Now, this is all developed around the experience of the American Indians living in the presence of European immigrant, in, in migrants to the New World and the intrusiveness of European ways of doing things upon what had pre-existed. And I particularly remember the patterns pointed out about what happened amongst the Plains Indians in the high plains of North America who got on back of horses and started to ride around as horses, of course, hadn't existed before the Spaniards got there. And the enormous expansion of human possibility that riding a horse, marching, uh, galloping off in all directions, opened before those who did it, meant that once done, it was impossible not to want to do it, not to want to exploit the horse and its energy and speed. But having done so, they then had to remodel all the accoutrements of life. They became horse nomads, quite like the horse nomads of Eurasia. And uh, new forms of clothing, new forms of weaponry, new forms of houses. And it was possible to watch on, because of travelers' records and archaeological remains from the various Indi Indian tribes who became nomads, how particular, what I called them, culture traits, elements of this this equipment necessary to live in this fashion moved up from Mexico and you could draw isobars how in a given decade the lines for this particular trait and that particular trait moved north up into the Canadian uh, prairies. A whole array of related skills are then moving northward. It's called cultural diffusion of course in the anthropological language and it could be mapped. And this looked like an extremely plausible and very well attested example of how social change had happened in a particular time, and I was prepared to think that was how social change generally happened. Contact, borrowing, adjustment. But, you see, if that's the case, the pattern that Toynbee had drawn of separate civilizations reenacting or following parallel courses but unable to communicate with one another except on certain specified occasions, what he called renaissances, and parentation affiliation relationships, uh, there is no reason for that inability to communicate. Why not across civilizational boundaries too? Not that autonomous closed character of the civilizational uh, pattern that Toynbee had detected in human history. Now this, is a, this was, I must say, latent in my mind. I was not, could not have expressed nearly as concisely as I just did the discrepancy between his point of view and my own when I first read Toynbee. But nevertheless, my, my feeling about what matters in history, the motor of, his, of historic change, was very deeply shaped by this cultural anthropological model and the beautiful clarity and precision with which you could follow it across the high prairies of North America.
And when, in due course, by a series of concatenations of good luck, I was ready to sit down and start writing that book, The Rise of the West, to which Professor Hudsblum referred, I was I approached it with the assumption that the relationships across civilizational boundaries would be of importance comparable to the relations which had existed amongst the Indian tribes as they uh, borrow and acculturate themselves to the life of a horse nomad in the late 18th and 19th centuries. And this was the principle in which that book was written, and that is the organizing idea that holds it together. Um, now I will revert to reading instead of and try to get through the lecture in the specified 45 minutes. <clears throat> when the book finally appeared in uh, 1963, Toynbee avoided direct comparison with his own work by generously declaring, quote, the rise of the West is the most lucid presentation of world history in narrative form that I know, because his was not narrative but analytical. And his principal professional critic and antagonist, Hugh Trevor Roper, was a good deal more extravagant because he wrote, this is not only the most learned and most intelligent, it is also the most stimulating and fascinating book that has ever set out to recount and explain the whole history of mankind. Now this praise, I suspect, was very much inspired by his desire to put Toynbee down, though I do not know that for a fact. But I do know that his extravagant hyperbole had a good deal to do with the book's initial success. Uh, the climate of opinion in the United States in 1963 was also propitious because this was the time when the nation's post-war political engagement in the wider world was still fresh and knowing more about the different peoples with whom we found ourselves entangled seemed pretty obviously desirable. And in general, the theme of my book was reassuring because I concluded that all the confusion and cross-purposes of the past had resulted in a gradual and often unforeseen accumulation of greater and greater effective power over nature and over larger and larger groupings of human beings. And at a time when the United States was engaged in a worldwide struggle with the USSR, such a vision was ambiguous, but also at least mildly reassuring, since optimistic Americans assumed that despite the errors and mistakes they might make along the way, their good intentions would, event would eventually prevail. And, my, and most Americans felt that the world was still out there to be understood and then reformed along American lines. My book contributed to the first of those goals, to understand the world, and was welcomed accordingly. And I am grateful, even though what I wrote was meant to refute the second assumption, that the American, the world was waiting to become just like the Americans, only a little know-how and perhaps an infusion of institutional reform to start along that path. But it means that the accident of timing had a good deal to do with the way the book was received. Yet I still would claim that it has the virtue of coming closer than had been done before to living up to its subtitle, which was A History of the Human Community. I've often been told I should have called the book that, that calling it The Rise of the West was a mistake. But I'm not sure, I'm, I don't know that I agree with that or not. Uh, important errors and deficiencies in the book have since become apparent to me, and I will mention some of them soon. But I have never had occasion to doubt the validity of the main organizing principle, the central role of contacts across cultural boundaries as provocateur of historical change. Think, for example, of how the Cold War transformed the USSR and the USA, making them resemble one another more closely than before. Despite the divergence of ideas and ideals, which were certainly an important part of their collision, 
This did not prevent Ameri the American military-industrial complex and the CIA from beginning to resemble their co Soviet counterparts. And simultaneously, as events after 1989 showed, the American style of consumerism and a wish for greater personal freedom were surreptitiously seeping into the Soviet Union, undermining the socialist faith. And it seems plain to me <clears throat> that other encounters and rivalries in other times had similar effects, shaping the world's history as it really happened, to echo Bronca's famous phrase. And that uh, certainly was the assumption behind my book. And I dis defined successive historical eras and structured each chapter around the idea that a particular part of Eurasia for a few centuries enjoyed superior skills to those of the peoples round about anywhere else in the world. A very uncomfortable fact for the other peoples, which required them to react to that perceived superiority by doing something to change their own ways. And fear was as powerful as envy. Rejecting foreign ways was as subversive of, lo of local use and want as was admiration since in either case, existing conduct would have to change to repel the novelty or to somehow make it one's own. And indeed, as I see things still, then and now, once obvious gaps in levels of skill arose among different peoples of the earth, an irreversible process of action and reaction set in. And as a result of that process, Specialized urban skills, the wealth and power they generated, were bound to spread simply because people almost always preferred wealth and power to their opposites. <laughs> and the driving force came from the perception that strangers at a distance had something useful, attractive, or threatening, which we ourselves lack. Now, it is true that you can withdraw from a disturbing outside contact sometimes, and a few peoples who consistently took that path still survive in remote rainforests, islands, and deserts. But that was exceptional. On land suitable for agriculture, even if a group of people refused to risk change and did decide to flee from outside disturbance, others who were willing to come to terms with the possessors of superior skills soon moved in and borrowed what they could and submitted when they had to and in general exchanged ideas, goods, and services with distant centers of high skill as available means of transport and communication permitted, with the overall result of a sporadic territorial expansion of the sort of complex, skilled societies that we call civilized. And as the geographic reach of the civilizational spheres of influence expanded, the distinct and separate centers of high skills that arose initially in Eurasia and in the Americas eventually came into close enough contact with one another to create the global system in which we all find ourselves today. And this basic view of the human past still seems correct to me. Errors in 1963 were not in conception, but in detail, though some of the details are very important ones such as the primacy of Chinese skill, wealth, and power between 1000 and 1450 or something like that. And this feature of world history was quite hidden from me by the way Chinese scholars had interpreted their country's past, a view they transmitted to the first generations of Western Sinologists. Because in the eyes of patriotic Chinese historians, the fact that the Sung Dynasty, which reigned from 960 to 1269, never controlled the whole country, and of course succumbed, succumbed to the Mongols in 1279. And this to them signified a deplorable imperial weakness, even though they recognized that some aspects of Chinese high culture, especially painting and philosophy, had attained superior excellence, that classical formulation in the era of the Sung. It was only after my book was out in the 1960s and 70s when a few path-breaking studies of Chinese economics and technology appeared 
Was it possible to see that the skills and the wealth of Sun China far surpassed anything known elsewhere in the world? And it was by borrowing administrative and technical school skills from the Chinese that the Mongols and other barbarians had been able to occupy part and then all of China, and not incidentally to project their power westward all the way to Russia. In short, what had been viewed as a proof of weakness, the failure to control the northern provinces, was more properly understood as a proof of the attractive and transformative power that Chinese innovations exercised upon their neighboring peoples. And that influence, of course, reached all the way to Western Europe. As you realize when you know, when you realize, recognize that gunpowder and printing and the compass all affected European society in the late Middle Ages profoundly and had initially come, came across the Eurasian world from China. But this was quite hidden from me when I set out to comprehend these centuries. And I st instead wrote a chapter which I called Step Conquerors and the European Far West, failing to see how both the Mongol conquests and the rise of medieval Europe were connected with their borrowings from China. And this is the central failure of insight in that book. It made me miss, the, the state of scholarship made me miss the mainstream of human innovation in those centuries, concentrating instead on secondary manifestations of the principal novelty of the age. A second defect of my book was that I overemphasized the autonomy and coherence of the separate civilizations of Eurasia and of pre-Columbian America, which was a tribute to Arnold Toynbee and the way his A Study of History continued to reverberate in my mind. But thanks to a school of world systems historians of whom André Gunder Frank, who used to be in Amsterdam, was a leader, I now think that the process of dissolving local autonomy into expanding interactive networks began with the initial expansion of civilizations onto new ground and intensified with every subsequent improvement of transport and communication that increased the contacts across geographical and cultural boundaries. As a corollary of this, I now also believe that my use of the term civilization to refer to rather coherent and unitary human cultures was much overdone. Within the societies we call civilized, diversity and instability commonly prevails, and unity was usually conspicuous by its absence. A more accurate vision of human reality would focus intention on networks of communication rather than on civilization, states, or religions. After all, it is participation in communication networks that make us human and establish our membership in each and every kind of human group. And large-scale history is largely a record of how human groups form, interact, dissolve across time and space. Now, the most important of these communication networks are gestural and verbal, comprising what infants learn at their mother's knee and everything else they need to grow up and become functioning adults and receive in face-to-face -face encounters throughout their lives. But historical records very seldom tell us much about those networks and the primary guilt groups built around them. But that is how human beings, for the most part, do actually live still to this day. So that this fundamental level of the human past largely escapes historical knowledge. But in urban societies and among occupationally differentiated peoples, relations among the primary groups were regulated, defined, and described, or sometimes just hinted at, in written records. And it now seems to me that what we call a civilization was primarily held together by a code of conduct to which its rulers and their principal subordinates to subscribed, at least in public, however imperfectly they may have managed to live up to the prescriptions of the moral code. And once the rise of literacy has become a fact, these shared codes of conduct were usually enshrined in, I guess always enshrined in canonical scriptures, usually sacred scriptures, but not always, 
familiarity with which was transmitted from generation to generation by some sort of formal educational system. And civilizations, therefore, it came to be very intimately associated with religions, as the names Christendom and Darul Islam both indicate. Yet within such civilizations, various subordinated groups had communication networks of their own and sometimes derived moral guidance from the same sacred texts as their masters, sometimes invoked different ones, or sometimes depended on oral transmission alone. Now, always such groups had to accommodate to their political superior, superiors and the tax collectors. And wherever the subordinated groups met and mingled, they developed various deference hierarchies to regulate relations with one another. And from time to time, by negotiation, sometimes punctuated by riots or other forms of local violence, the patterns of relationship among such groups altered, sometimes quite abruptly. And every so often, the ruling elite itself was supplanted by foreign invaders or by successful rebels. And thus, civilizations were a loose federation of diverse groups, shading off down the social scale and across distance toward persons and groups that had no significant contact with the distant rulers' own culture and moral code. And since multiple communications nets were the primary factor in creating human commonality of every sort, whether it's local, ethnic, occupational, national, religious, civilizational, or trans-civilizational, no single sort of identity towers over all the rest. Civilizations were sustained by one kind of network, but when the gap between rulers and ruled was very wide, which was common, through most of the recorded past, the ways of the rulers were not the same as the ways of the subjects. And by speaking of civilizations as though such fissures did not exist, we exaggerate the power of the rulers and the solidarity of the populations they ruled over. And it now appears to me that I frequently fell into this trap in writing The Rise of the West. Greater sensitivity to urban subgroups and to the localism of village communities on the one hand and more attention to diasporas and other groups that maintain connections across civilizational boundaries on the other is what I would aim at today. But instead of pursuing the deficiency of my efforts to reshape the human past any further, let me conclude with a few words in defense of the global scale of conceptualization that my historical inquiries exemplify. Ever since Ranka's time, Academic historians have been apprenticed to their craft by writing a monograph based on what we proudly call primary sources, usually located in official archives. But the need to finish a doctoral dissertation in a bearable length of time imposes very narrow limits on such inquiries, and unreflective historians sometimes convince themselves that the truth they had discovered depended entirely on what the archives had to say. This view naively neglects the question that took them to their sources in the first place and the considerations that prevented them from simply transcribing everything they discovered word for word. But if truth lurked and ready made in official records, accurate transcription will be the only thing a conscientious historian could do. Whereas in actuality it seemed obvious to me that it is the questions that historians ask that exercise the governing force and allow the eager searcher to decide what to pay attention to and what to neglect in the sources he consults. And those questions in practice are imposed by the state of the art. That is to say, historians frame their questions by reading what other historians have written and wondering about the adequacy of their conclusions. New sources that would test old conclusions is one obvious possibility, opening a new archive. That's always exciting to an historian. But far more important are the changing assumptions about human behavior and motivation deriving from current notions about human affairs rather than from historical writing proper. So every age, because of these changes in under, uh, outlook upon human affairs, revise the history to reflect new sensibilities and define new collective identities.
In my time, the major, phase, major direction that has taken in the historical profession is to look at subnational groups, previously overlooked, women in the United States, blacks, and other disadvantaged populations as against the dominant white male uh, tradition. But the contemporary effort to write world history, and I'm not alone in this effort, is an example of that same effort because it clearly reflects the public experience of our time. And different questions from those that local historians ask will generate different answers. And the simple awareness of what was happening in different parts of the world simultaneously often will suggest connections and relationships that historians who focus within a given linguistic area are bound to miss. And this was really the principal in intellectual discovery that I embodied in my book, The Rise of the West, and all other serious world historians are doing the same. But those long distance relationships amongst between civilizations are just as real as connections within a single country, or for example, the correspondence amongst learned societies that so accelerated the advance of European science in the 17th and 18th centuries. Often, written evidence is lacking for important interchanges. And that is why for so long, for example, European historians preferred to believe that printing and gunpowder had been independently invented in Europe. Textual evidences of their appearance in the Rhinelands are easy to discover, but no text describes the conversations amongst artisans and travelers that transmitted knowledge of those techniques from China. But to argue that was not, what was not written down does not exist is really quite illogical. And when you know from texts like William of Rubric, Marco Polo, even Batuta, to name only the most conspicuous testimonies, that a great many illiterate craftsmen and merchants and other practical men of affairs were moving to and fro across the breadth of the Mongol Empire in the 13th and 14th centuries, it is no great leap of faith to believe that technical information about printing and gunpowder also seeped across Asia <clears throat> and for reasons that can plausibly be reconstructed, quickly acquired far greater practical importance in distant Europe than anywhere else, including China itself. Earlier, China had borrowed the skills and moral attitudes required for bizarre training, trading, coming from the Muslim world, where such traditions were very long standing. And in this instance, for example, we know the Buddhist monasteries the were the principal mediators. Their existence and economic practices, as well as their ties with the trading communities of Central Asia, can all be established by documentary evidences, combined with archaeological and icon iconographic remains. But when imported commercial habits and conventions were superimposed upon China's existing network of canals and navigable rivers, results were very different from anything known before in the Middle East or anywhere else because canal boats soon permitted cheap and safe transport of commodities of common consumption throughout the Chinese heartlands, with the result that an exchange economy in which the majority of the entire population took part ca came on stream within two or three centuries. The resulting specialization of production allowed China to attain greater wealth than ever before and rewarded improvements of skill so dependably as to provoke that remarkable upsurge in quantity and quality of out out output that made Sung China the leader of the world. Transmission of skills that found new and unprecedented scope in the receiving society, as bizarre trading did in China, and as printing and gunpowder later was to do in Europe, were what provoked those occasional shifts in world primacy that defined the successive eras and affected the lives of all the interacting peoples who shared in the communications networks of the age. And so a history that searches for and describes such shifts with appropriate deference to documentary evidence about, one, about communication nets and the sort of information that was available to pass through them offers a portrait of the past that emphasizes what mattered most to contemporaries and to their heirs, even if at the time itself no one was fully conscious of or chose to record where a particular novelty had originated or exactly how it had been disseminated 
by word of mouth. And I would argue that such a history is quite as true as history on any other scale. It depends on documents like any monograph, supplemented by material evidences as discovered by archaeologists and art historians, which puts it on a plane with history on any other scale. Accuracy and adequacy to the facts always depends on the insight brought to the task by the inquiring historian. No more, no less. And indeed, excessive source material can be frustrating as his, to historians as deficiencies are. If there's too much information, you get confused. You cannot see what really mattered. This is one of the problems with the history of the Second World War. History writing seems to me is quite like mapping. The most minute monograph, like the smallest scale map, distorts reality by suppressing details. That's the only way we can put the multiplicity of what exists into words. And the fact that words were written by someone long ago doesn't make, make them any truer than words written today. Rather, what it means is that modern historians often feel free to correct and contradict what their documents say because they approach the world with different guiding ideas and know that that couldn't possibly be true, even if the medieval author said it was. Sometimes mistakenly, it's when it comes to epidemic disease. Obviously, history on the grand scale also distorts actual experience, highlighting some things, sometimes of things of which the contemporaries were entirely ignorant, and bypassing much which most concerned them at the time. And intermediate scales of history do the same. And the appropriate distortion at each level is analogous to the appropriate distortion that different map projections give to maps on different scales. And for both maps and for histories, it's what's left out that imparts meaning and usefulness. And what is appropriate left out varies from one scale to another. We all know that patterns and relationships visible to glance on a world map cannot be discerned by consulting vast numbers of small scale maps, one after the other, and vice versa. You can't see on a world map the street, outlet, the street layout of Amsterdam to walk about safely. Each scale has its value, and those who operate on each scale need to be aware of what other scales can do and exhibit. History seems to be quite the same. That is because an appropriate set of questions define what needs to be included and excluded at different scales of map making and of history writing alike. In both cases, the questions asked, whether geographical or historical, elicit intelligible patterns from a jumble of incoherence by selecting relevant aspects from what is, for all practical purposes, an infinite array of potential information. And that's what human intelligence is all about. That's what we do, always and all the time discernment of larger and of smaller patterns and of their interaction is what all human sense perception and symbolically formulated knowledge aspires to. The process of selection and simplification appears to be quite the same for history as it is for physics, biology, literary criticism, or anything else. Big questions are as legitimate as small ones. Patterns apparent at different levels are equally valid being in every case the creation of human minds, playing on the variability of experience, continually simplifying, selecting in order to guide effects of action. And in our world, where all the peoples of the earth are ensnared in a global communications net nowadays, intelligible world history can perhaps provide a useful guide to public policies and minimize unwelcome surprises, or at least I hope so. In the meanwhile, and even if that practical payoff were never to appear, the effort to understand the human past in its totality, it can be, and is, I would say, a delight in itself, challenging the intellect and imagination as much as any other inquiry can do. And I recommend it to you, warmly as very much worth pursuing. Thank you for listening patiently to this rather self-serving discourse. An old man can perhaps be pardoned for what amounts to an apologia pro vita mea. And it may even be appropriate to the occasion, since I like to think that if Erasmus were alive today, 
he would take kindly to the enlargement of the human past that world history opens so entrancingly before us. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> I do have the privilege to be the first one to ask questions from this spot to Professor McNeil, but I hope you won't feel shy by my uh, rather um, strong position here to take the microphone and ask questions yourselves um, in the course of our debate you're most explicitly and kindly invited to do so. Um, the title of your lecture, Professor McNeil, was Reshaping the Human Past, but listening to it, it made me think it might as well have been reshaping my questions, <laughs> because uh, part of the things I wanted to ask have been answered by now. However, um, it is not without reason that in the final lines of your address, you say this is um, somehow also an apologia pro vita sua. Um, and that is the point of my first question. Writing world history, talking about the concepts you talk about, is very stimulating, very uh, intriguing on the one hand, but it also is slightly annoying given the practice of the trade of history. I mean, there is also this strong and stern tendency in history to know more and more about less and less, to specialize more and more and to avoid the broad global concept because it is mistrusted. How, having given the apology, is it to work in an academic climate with your preference for the broad concepts you use? I mean, talking about the details, you're the man who knows what the talking is about. You were, after all, the editor of the Journal of Modern History, um, printing the details always and every time. So there is a sort of collision between cultures. You wish me to... I quite agree with you. But the analog, analog of the map seems to me completely relevant here. Uh, geographers don't suppose that because uh, you can write, make very small maps, maps of a very small area, that somehow you don't need a world map at the same time. And it's the interplay between different levels of generality that can give new and, and fertile questions to each level of generality. And the the reasons for the disdain of world history in the academic profession seem to be mostly uh, misguided. The notion that somehow truth resides in a primary document that was written 500 years ago, and all I have to do is go and find it, and somehow that makes it true, whereas a statement that I might make about the arrival of gunpowder in Europe, there's no document, then it's not true. That's that's. Epistemologically absurd. Well, we love think to think that not things. only God is in the detail, but truth is in the detail. And our right. friends from geography tend to convince us by sending out their measurement instruments in the street and in the land, collect the tiniest details. But they, they make their maps by leaving out the details, if I may say. So you, don't have, you don't have a map that has every blade of grass on it. That would be completely, contradic completely counter, counter, counterproductive. It would d delay and confuse. The effort is to simplify and understand. And it is by generalizing and schematizing that human beings understand the world. One of the things that you must remember about yourself is you sit in this audience. You're doing a most miraculous thing, if, assuming you're listening to what's being said. There are a large number of sensory inputs coming into you, your body, all over it. And what you're doing is focusing upon a tiny little irritation to the, the, the membranes of your ear. And then very complicated things happen within the brain. You're paying attention to a tiny part of the total sensory input. Why? Because somehow you think it's important. 
Some of you think that's what that matters in the situation. You're blacking out everything else. That's what we do. We, uh, we reject background noise and make things meaningful by selective attention. And that's what you do when you write history. It's what you do when you do any kind of science. But you're polemical enough to say, in your case, that the document of the gunpowder is not there, whereas, whilst listening, the document is there. Um, we have the original source at hand, and then we work out. Like the geographer who makes the map, he has his one meter stick somewhere in, if, it not, if it's not his office, his colleague's <laughs> office. So you're polemical in saying sometimes there is no source. You mean, well, you mean we do not have the equivalent of the meter stick or of the uh, that's what I mean. mathematical projection of the geographer making a map. Uh, that is only partly true. Chronology is a kind of meter stick. The sun goes around the earth, there are years, and this defines the rhythms of oh. agricultural year and of human life. And chronology is a very, it's a wonderful, it straightens things out, you must know that. Uh, getting the sequence of events clear and crisp, sometimes you can't do it, sometimes the documents don't permit it. But when you can, you have that kind of equivalence of the geographer's meter stick. It's, it's, it's time instead of space. I don't think it's really different. You now, say it doesn't yeah. mean that history consists of saying, in year X, this happened, the year next year, something else happened, next year, something else happened. But it gives you that measure against which the patterns can be adjusted. And you can be pretty sure that you're not saying something happened before it. For it. It's, it's antecedent happened. And this can save you an enormous number of errors. Every historian knows that. Who makes the patterns? And who, how does who he make them? Who makes the patterns? The observer. Um, yes, he does. But you say it's the observer who needs to leave out, who in the final mm -hmm. product demonstrates his choices of what's left out. Now, we're always the slightly... Word demonstrate, I think, is a little strong. Um, het idee is, dames en heren, dat wij hier al enige tijd zitten te praten, maar het schijnt dat enkele van u um, het gevoel hebben dat ze naar een stomme film kijken. Zou op de achterste rij iemand die denkt dat dit een stomme film is, nu zijn hand willen opsteken? Kunt u mij verstaan op de achterste rij? Ja? Oké, okay, thank you very much. Um, there was a problem with the sound. We, we had to speak more closely into the mic. I think that would be very wise. Yes. All right, I will try to lean forward. Um, now, the thing is, we, we always get slightly uneasy about the historian who says, I am the beholder of the pattern, I am the one who left things out. We, more or less um, educated by the modern history schools, are desperate for knowing who left out what. <laughs> Well, I think that's an improper nervousness, if I may put it so. Uh, the idea that putting more in and more in and more in all adds to meaning, adds to intelligibility, adds to significance is simply not true. Uh, anyone who has tried to read the historiography of the Second World War knows that more and more information is just more confusing. It, it, it destroys the understanding of what, what happened. But how confusing was it for you as, for example, a practical historian editing a journal getting a letter of an author of an article saying, listen, I left out quite a bit, <laughs> and I'm, I'm, not I'm not going to tell you what. Well, mostly we don't confess to this. The, the, the epistemological <coughs> naivete of the historical profession, and I must say of other academic writers, seems to me enormous. They haven't thought of what they're doing, what language does. Language simplifies, language generalizes, language makes, imp the very use of language imposes patterns upon a, fluctuating flow of, I think I'm going too far away from this, uh, fluctuating flow of stimuli, it is a self, more or less self-consistent image, but it's not reality. And by having more words, you'll never get closer to reality. That's not possible. It's just not the way the human mind does things. The human mind does things by inventing fictions, things that are positively not true. I mean, such a thing as the existence of a nation. There's no such thing as a nation in a, any in tangible reality, yeah. sense. It's the state of mind of a certain number of people that creates a nation. And then they act as though it were true, and by God, they change the world. 
by saying, let's do it. Let's cooperate. The, the basis of human cooperation nearly always is based around a series of fictions. Things that are not yet true, maybe may become true if they act together, or maybe will never be attained. But that is how humanity has conquered the earth, by agreeing on things and cooperating together on things. But language is not a, it's not a transparent window upon reality. It is an active reality program of action for human life. And history is exactly that. The real, the main importance of history is that it tells you who you are, what groups you belong to, and what belonging to a given group normatively implies for your behavior. And that's what history is. And general history, history of the world says what it's like to be a human being, which is not an unimportant identity. Now, I think we have a tendency to understand quite quickly the historian who says, I um, collected as many details as I could find, I ordered them, and here you get my order. We tend to be fascinated, I think, by the historian who says, no, I'm not doing that, I'm leaving out, I'm giving you a structure, I'm giving you a pattern, something I saw in the material that went through my hands, and we get more or less curious for your kitchen secret, for the recipe for um, the, the general drift of making that pattern, mm -hmm. the choice of the map makers, the world map makers level. Well, I, t I tried to tell you where my principal idea came from, that is the stimulus of encountering some new, new way of doing things, the desire either to have it or to reject it, and what you had to do in response to that. This is how it seems to me most human, I mean, not just all human groups navigate through this world. Either we want it and we then change our ways or we reject it and then we also have to change our ways to keep it away. And that's how human history has happened unless I'm quite misguided. <laughs> now I can be my, my, quite misguided. I must quite recognize this is a, a abstract theoretical assumption about human life and that the notions of cultural diffusion that I built around it that I thought I saw evidences of in the written documents and in, actually you see it more vividly in art than you see it in written texts and often in technology. Art and technology are much more transparent to borrowings than in most literary, literate civilizations there is a, a cast of scribes who have mastered the language and who like to think that nothing outside the language can possibly be important to them. So that you can have people who are importing wholesale and the scribes won't notice it. Or they will use language which hides the importation. And this is particularly true in anything connected with uh, sacred religion that seems to be, uh, claims to be eternal and outside of human history, that it was revealed forever and will never change. So, uh, those who are tied to and committed to the, such a dogmatic faith will go to great lengths to deny what's plainly before their eyes and what the fact they really know, but they will not put it in print or put it on words because it would challenge the to total adequacy of their inherited truths. And this means that the written record is much less accurate to the encounters with the world outside the limits of the linguistic uh, world, the linguistic circle, than art and, uh, and technology. But you also know very well the, the danger of the method. I mean, the danger is looking in the huge quantity of sources or possible sources only for the thing that fits you. Yes. Um, I mean, is there to use a classical and uh, much debated upon concept of epistemology, is there any chance of refutation? Chance of refutation that would be uh, logical and convincing to yes. all hearers. Um, I, and I'm not sure I, I have a good answer to that. Any such perceived pattern has hard parts and soft parts. And new information, new texts, new digging, something can change one's understanding of uh, 
the relationship, the sort of thing that happened with me, to me with uh, Sun China. Data about the economic and technical achievements of Sun China was simply not available to me when I wrote The Rise of the West. And it was three or four scholars who wrote articles and books in the next decade yes. that made it clear that this was a misunderstanding. It was a dimension of that past which had previously been absent from the available literature. And the, the, the most experts, expert Chinese um, sinologists didn't know it. it. It was available in the totality of Chinese records when the right questions were asked piecing together bits of tax records to create a history of the iron and steel industry, for example, um, was possible, but nobody had ever done it. Until it's done, uh, this then, when it is done, it corrects, alters an appreciation of the relationship between the Chinese, the Mongols, and the non, the uh, Muslim and Christian worlds. Uh, very uh, dramatically and uh, that's a kind of refutation but it's, it's, it's development of new studies on a more restricted scale based upon primary sources in the classical form, classical way of academic history then permits anyone looking for larger holes to say aha, that, I didn't know that before now I see that the Mongols were in fact pupils of the Chinese and were in strengthening their power by appropriating skills from the Chinese, particularly the skill of bureaucratic management of military forces, and project their power westward and bring with them the, an array of Chinese technologies, which in a quite different setting in the Western European nations, develop a scale and power and significance that far surpassed anything that had yet been done in China. Now, it, can you refute that? No. Um, can, you, can you say, no, there was no transmission from China? For a long time, European historians believed there was no transmission from China. They never asked themselves the question. You can't prove it by documentary evidence, but you can read some of the travelers' accounts, the three I mentioned, William of Rubruck, mm -hmm. uh, Marco Polo, and uh, Ibn Battuta, and you know that William of Rubruck arrives in, in Karakoram, uh, the capital of the, uh, of the Mongol Empire at that time, and he finds a Flemish woman who had been born 15 miles from where he came from, married to a goldsmith, who had been uh, picked up in Hungary and carried off to the court to do his goldsmithing. Now, that's quite a hard fact. That is yes. a fact. Yes. And that tells you that there was a permeability yes. to the Eurasian world. And it wasn't just this single Flemish woman who traveled that way. And anything she knew, she could spread around amongst the Mongols. Anything she picked up amongst the Mongols, the Chinese, people like Marco Polo who came back could spread amongst the Europeans. And to think that there weren't people who were interested in such things as gunpowder that explodes is not plausible in the least. There was a core of Muscovy, a Russian, soldiers who were chosen for their height, who were the personal bodyguard of Kublai Khan, several thousand men, just like the Varangian guard that had previously served in the Byzantine court. And we know how the Varangian guard, after their discharge, went back home and told things to the Norwegians and the Swedes about the glories of Byzantium. The Russian corps also was discharged after a certain time. At least some of them went back home. The world was much more permeable than the fact they, did, they didn't write down. They were Another thing to think about, Marco Polo would not be known to exist. There is no document in the Venetian archives, which are very voluminous, yes. that will identify Marco Polo. Had he not been captured in war with the Genoese and thrown in jail with a writer of romances, and he told all these strange stories, and the writer of romances said, I've got to write this down, and he did with the result that when Marco Polo's travels first came out, they were assumed to be the writer of fiction because he, this man was a professional writer of romances, the author. And it was only in the 19th century that uh, a man named William Yule um, 
began to compare the geographical layout of the land with Marco Polo's report and said, my God, this man may be right. It had just been dismissed as a myth, like John de Mandeville's travels, which were a myth. Yes, yes. Uh, and um, then I think no one today doubts that Marco Polo did indeed leave Venice, serve in the court of Kublai Khan, and return uh, some 20 years afterward. And much, if not all, of what he says is true. Now, he, we wouldn't know this without this total accident. The, the fallibility of written records as a guide to what really happened is surely dramatically suggested by these observations. That is by any standard a good answer, by the way. Um, you also wrote um, a book on a much more concise subject, Venice, on a, a comparable concise subject, the post-war history of Greece, if I'm uh, do you remember well? Is there a different, an, an entirely different method in the way you um, worked on these books compared, as, as compared to The Rise of the West, The Pursuit of Power, and so forth? I don't recognize it as a real difference of method. Each case, there's a question to be answered. In the case of the book on Venice, what I was interested in was how was it that the imprint of Italian skills was to be seen in the Kremlin today? The Kremlin is an Italian building, built by Italian architects, actually, designed by them. And when I first saw this before my eyes, I thought it was very puzzling. I didn't know that Italy had conquered Mus Muscovy. Uh, it wasn't really A true known fact. <laughs> the Italians conquered Muscovy, but what happened was that the Grand Duke of Moscow, when he wanted the best defenses he could have, sent to northern Italy and got builders who knew how to build of stone and brick and built the, the Kremlin under their direction. And uh, this other, other kinds of influence came from Italy likewise, so that in, in matters of theology, for example, the Nikon reforms are a function of the exposure to the techniques of the Renaissance scholar, scholarship in the person of Maxim the Greek. Uh, this kind of thing meant that Russia and Eastern Europe in general were in touch with the Renaissance. It used to be said that Western Europe received the Renaissance in the 16th century, and this was one of the differences between Western Europe and Eastern Europe. And the point of my book was to say the Renaissance was received in Eastern Europe too in a more attenuated and also somewhat delayed fashion, but it also made, transformed and made great differences in the cultural and techno technical life of Eastern Europe. That Europe is not divided by a sort of, by an iron curtain, by an impenetrable wall, but the Eastern, the Orthodox Christians, as well as the Latin Christians, went to school to the pagan Italians, or the quasi-pagan Italians, and had a lot to learn. They fitted into a different social structure, a different political structure, and had different consequences in the East and in the West, that's true. But it didn't lead to convergence, but there was a commonality, a shared history between the two parts of Europe. And another book I wrote called Europe's Step Frontier does this by land instead of by sea. The, the, the uh, resemblances between what happened on the Turkish frontier, the Habsburg frontier, the Muscovite frontier to absorb the previously steppe peoples, the semi-nomadic or fully nomadic populations that existed there in 1500. And the processes are very parallel, coming from the south, coming from the west, coming from the north. Uh, so it was this, now in the case of the steppe frontier, I knew the settlement had occurred. Uh, there was the analog of the American frontier in the back of my mind. And there was the feeling that the cheap, uh, the common observation that Turkey decayed after 1683 and the other powers were rising seemed to me to need serious modification because the Turks were advancing into Romania and became much more effective in their exploitation of Romania in just the same way the Habsburgs were doing the same to Hungary and the Russians were doing to Ukraine. The Russians got a bigger and richer piece of territory out of it than the Habsburgs or the Ottomans, but the processes are parallel. Well, now that sort of thing... But it's, it sounds almost as if it's the other way around, beginning with these parallels between frontiers and then extrapolating to a general idea of that. 
Uh, well, I, I, I try to think how I got to these ideas. One of, the, one of the backgrounds is there was a book written by a former professor at the University of Chicago who taught my, who was the doctoral, doctor father of my father way back in the 1920s, which he uh, describes the German knights conquest of the Transalban agents as a frontier phenomenon. His name was James Westfall Thompson. And he was transporting the American vision of the frontier yeah, eastward. Yeah. And my book, Europe's Step Frontier, is taking the same thing into a slightly different part of the world and saying it's happening not just from the European side, but also from the, the Islamic side, the Muslim side. And so I had that kind of frame in my mind of how this had happened in the north of Europe from James Westfall Thompson. It's a quite a good book, actually, still a good book, even though he's full of detailed errors. He was guilty of faulty citations. Got his footnotes mixed up sometimes. But the idea is still valid. And, and do you then, in, in the, let's say, in the prolegomena of your research, check the idea? Because you say he transported the American idea to the northern Alban German, Germanic region. Well, transporting is sometimes almost projecting. Yes. I mean, do I tell you how I got to my ideas before <laughs> I write them? Not usually. Usually I think it's best to simply do it and let the reader decide for himself or other historians say this fellow doesn't understand what he's talking about or is the case to me that sounds pretty true. Maybe he's right. And uh, methodological discourse, I, I found not not my good, my metje. When you ask me these methodological questions, I'm, I'm a little bit tongue-tied. Um, I never thought it was useful or necessary to tell the reader how I had gone about doing it. I tried to do it instead. And maybe that's a deficiency. No, no, absolutely. I'm it just may, taking my chance. It may <laughs> deceive the reader by making it look much more plausible, much more well attested than it is. Uh, I wouldn't really deny that. Some general warning, this is one man's intelligence working upon a certain body of material and he produces this kind of understanding and he's probably wrong. You could say that to every preface, I've, every book I've ever written and you wouldn't be telling a, telling a lie. And my the sense of proof that it's a line of inquiry that anyone else addressing the same materials would arrive at the same conclusions is simply not the case. Different minds see things differently. Okay. And uh, I don't think there's any escape from that in studies of, of human behavior. The um, complexity of human behavior is so great you can't run repeat experiments try over again on the step frontier before my eyes please or whatever else it is it's a one-time affair extremely imperfectly recorded in written forms suggested and attested to in other ways by archaeological and material remains and then you make the best of it Thank Which you. doesn't mean yes. that making the world make sense is not still in a compelling and even necessary process. We, if you don't do it by historians, you, historically you do it by much more abstract uh, myth-making. Things that ha happened long ago and established things the way they are. All people have myths. How did the world get to be the way it is? It happened this way. And sometimes like, they're creation myths or something of the sort, and the assumption is once established, it stays the way it is. Only two or three peoples ever got the idea that history changes, that there's not an initial creation, then stasis, but process and transformation, which is either recurrent, as in the Chinese uh, dynastic cycle, or set up by God, really, the creation and the eventual end of the world, the Christian, Jewish, uh, and, and Muslim vision of uh, human condition and uh, more detailed history, history that looked at politics as important, was really restricted to the Greeks and the uh, Chinese. So it's an atypical human aspect. We normally think that society and the way things are is the way things are and the way things always have been. When you're a small child, that's the way you grow up. A child has the terrible desire to say yes, no, true, false, good, bad. You have to divide the world by clear and distinct uh, 
antinomies so you know how to behave. You know what to do, what berry to eat, what berry to stay away from because it's poisonous. That's what the linguistic and, and mental processes we inherit impel us to do. And the idea that, yes, but it's not quite, it changes, it's gray, it's not white, it's not black, is extremely difficult for a young child or for most adults to believe. History runs absolutely contrary to human desires. It's only after you get to about 30 that you genuinely believe the world changes. And the world you grew up to isn't there anymore. I can still remember the time when I was teaching a class in Chicago and I mentioned the Depression. And I looked up before me and faces were blank. They didn't know what the Depression was. Now that's what I grew up to, and it made me realize I was talking across a gulf. Change became visible. And I was actually living in a historic age where things changed. And I was an historian. I should have known better. <laughs> But to make it come in upon myself that way, I will never forget that moment. That they are different from me because they do not know what the Depression is. And you, usually, you really had to be over 30 to appreciate history, to believe it happens. And when you get to be my age, you know it happens. <laughs> Thank you so far. May I give you, as the first one from the audience, the chance to ask your question? Yes, I would like to um, go away from the epistem epistemological problem. Um, in my head, the discussion you're having has an equivalent in Holland. Um, I'm, sh I'm almost sure that when you were a child, you read the books of Hendrik Willem van Loon. Yes. Yes? And you know he's a Dutchman. Yes, yes, I yes. do. I do. He was a Dutchman. Yes. I believe he's dead now. Quite a long time. <laughs> yes. But I can assure you that 99% of the audience do not even know his name anymore. In the year that you published your... Uh, your first and big work about the rise of the West, um, the work of Van Loon was really, well, killed by one of our historians, um, uh, Johan Huizinga, who wrote about uh, the, the decline of the Middle, middle Ages. The waning, the waning of the Middle Ages, but yes. please come to the point of the question, where the question mark is. Yes. Well, I think, well, your discussion was a little bit this discussion, because Van Loon, for instance, wrote the story of mankind. Um, there is this, this, this sort of tradition, H.G. E. Wells, Henry Gillum Van Loon, uh, Toynbee, and your work, and there's this other uh, tradition. My question, question is, do you think that your influenced by your own culture, maybe by your reading of Hendrik Willem van Loon. For instance, The Rise of the West contains these beautiful small pictures. And Hendrik van Loon, as you know, uh, uh, made all these pictures as well. Okay, thank you. You gave credits to Toynbee already. Are you giving them also to Mr. van Loon? Not very much. I, I did read the book when I was, I guess, a child. I'm not sure how old, but it didn't didn't ring any particular bells. It still was written within what I call this liberal tradition. It didn't have new ideas of any great significance and didn't have much new information. It wasn't a, a path-breaking book in my opinion. Okay, thank you. Mr. I mean, H.G. Wells was far more significant. Uh, I'd like to ask your opinion about the work of another individual who has mostly been focusing on the interaction among civilizations, speaking of Mr. Huntington, whose <laughs> article, The Clash of Civilizations in Foreign Affairs, several years ago, the, uh, lack, of, the lack of communication, <laughs> uh, postulated that the thesis is that the world can be divided into sort of huge culture zones, Western, Muslim, Confucian, and that the upcoming decades will be dominated by conflict, wars among these various what he calls civilizations. It seems more uh, simplistic, reductionist, less subtle than your own works, but perhaps more uh, appropriate for an age where mass communication has made the interaction between cultures 
much more invasive and aggressive than in, in the former times of simple interaction among individuals. What are your opinions? Well, on I have a review of Mr. Huntington's book coming out in the New York Review of Books probably this weekend, oh. which is approximately <laughs> 20 pages long. <laughs> and uh, the, the, if I summed up my reaction, I would say that I agree with him that the uh, religious reactions, the religious confrontations are becoming more important, more prominent, more active in human consciousness in many parts of the world, but that there are commonalities running across the civilizations and that his recommendation for the future, sort of hunkering down within the, the Western, uh, he doesn't call it Christendom, but he really does mean Christendom, <laughs> against the Muslim threat is a recipe for uh, really for a third world war, for a disaster to the future. And that pro and the civilizations are not nearly as unitary as his language suggests that the uh, probabilities of uh, confrontation but also accommodation, that sort of thing that went on between the Soviet Union and the USS, USA when it was ideological, secular ideology, will probably continue in when it becomes more, more often or more co colored by religious ideology or ideals, <coughs> that the clinging to universalism, as the United States does in its official uh, discourse, may be a saving grace in these situations, a secular universalism, the universalism of the 18th century, the enlightenment, the rational individual endowed with rights. And this is one of the things Huntington is very emphatic in rejecting as a guide to American policy, that it may have positive effects in minimizing or softening or if affecting the behavior of religiously opposed uh, groups. As it did affect and soften somewhat the encounter between communist and uh, capitalist uh, in the recent past. But it's, uh, it's a complicated, and qu I wouldn't call it an unsophisticated book. He is quite a sophisticated man. On February the 20th, I'm going to sit down with a panel between Mr. Huntington in the middle and me, and um, uh, probably Akira Iria and uh, Ernest May to debate the thesis in public at Harvard University. So it is being talked about in the United States today, and I am going to be taking part in that debate. Where did you say the review was going to appear? Yeah, sorry, your New York Review of Books. Review. It'll, it'll be out this weekend. Okay. Thank you. Yes, you may. Yes. Uh, hi, I'm a history teacher, and I constantly struggle with my students how to teach them to understand history, or as you said, what it means to be a human being. And my greatest problem is this. On one hand, if I provide my students with an overview of history, they may miss the, inc in the intricacies of the detail. However, you had just said that if you pour over detail, you may not understand it any better than before. How do you create a balance? between providing students with an understanding well, of history. Well, teaching history to the young is like the task of Sisyphus, uh, pulling things <laughs> uphill, because it runs against the grain of the human mind, which is clear, distinct, and dogmatic statements. Good, true, false, uh, uh, good, bad, false, true, black, white. That's what we want. That's what every child wants desperately. So they will know what to do in the particular situ situation that resembles that you have just described. That is why the sort of caricature of history is teaching you, giving you lessons, George Washington and the cherry tree and the rest of it. Be good, don't tell lies, that kind of thing. And all is gray, maybe, perhaps, yes, but it changed later, it wasn't the same here, it wasn't the same there, which is what the stuff of historical discourse and pattern recognition is distressing to the human mind. And as I said, you really can't believe in history till you're about 30. And you probably are not quite that old. Maybe you are that old by now. Nevertheless, I think it's worth trying. And I think the way you can, the way I tried when I taught world history myself was to look at these uh, key shifts in the locus of 
primary skill and power and then ask how one shifted to the other, what was it that allowed China to overtake the Muslim world, that allowed Europe to overtake the Chinese world, and uh, a sense of the major eras, the characteristics of those eras, a sense that the patterns of life around us today, when certain parts of the world are privileged and other parts of the world are in, at disadvantage with respect to the rich and powerful peoples is a particular constellation that will not last forever, that has been changed in the past, this sense that the way things are is not the way things always will be. This seems to me the one thing you can hope to transmit to the young, that the world does not consist of fixed categories which now, once you've mastered them, you know them forever, that things change. I don't know that how much you can expect them to carry away from that kind of a course. The other, th the other thing I would do is try to show them, have them as directly exposed as you possibly can to samples, the products of past ages and peoples alien to their, themselves, to their own immediate ancestors. Uh, the sense that there is a kind of human resonance that can run across these cultural differentiations. When I taught world history, I always got a big rise out of the Epic of Gilgamesh, uh, out of uh, the diaries of Lady Murasaki, out of the poetry of Li Po. Now much of that reliance on the uh, translations of Arthur Whaley may be Fictitious. It may be not in the originals, but I hope that's not true. The sense that there are human beings like us at the court of the, uh, the emperor of Japan in the 12th century. Lady Murasaki is a beautifully sensitive description of her relationship to other courtiers in the imperial palace. Or the personal insecurities and longings of Li Po and other Chinese poets of the classical Tang age that sound just, you know, they sound, they speak to us. They, that, I have felt like that. I have been drunk and regretted it afterward, uh, this kind of thing. Uh, that there is a human commonality or the possibilities of convergence of sentiment and feeling and longing in the human race. And then looking at works of art, they can do the same thing with visual art. Beautiful objects coming from different traditions. And that sense of the pluralism and human vivacity expressed in many different languages and many different styles is the other thing that I think a good course in history ought to leave with a student. And if you can convince them of that, that the world changes, it's not always going to be the way it is today, and there has been great variety and a certain commonality in the human encounter with the rest of the world, you've done a good job. And they don't need to remember any dates. Thank you. Yes, the gentleman from the corner may ask us. We've got time for only more, two more questions. So. Well, I have a very short question, Thank you. Maestro McNeil. I'm very glad that you are among us today. Uh, when I was consulting your uh, very interesting book on the rise of the West and uh, the world history, uh, I was struck by the fact, a little bit surprised, be, that you didn't mention uh, the study was once made by Panikar and Caroline Ware and Jan Romain, who three people, three historians, mm -hmm. made a study of the history of mankind by UNESCO. And well, we discussed already uh, Hendrik van Loon, <laughs> and you answered that he was not so important and uh, quite superficial, perhaps. But in my opinion, their endeavor was quite interesting in order to see how to combine uh, the, the histories of the different continents of the world. And in my, in my opinion, that was one of the first endeavors, in, fa in fact, ever made, even less idealistic than Toynbee did with his uh, civilizations. So I'm quite interested well, to know your reaction about the, it. The book you refer to is the UNESCO History, Cultural and uh, Scientific History of Mankind, unless I'm mistaken. 
which is a multi-volume work done collaboratively uh, by many different contributors. And the uh, volumes differ in quality very greatly. Some are quite good and some of them are perfectly dreadful. Uh, there isn't a coherent picture of the history of humankind as a whole that emerges from it. And the basic presumption came out of the uh, Comtean tradition that there was a truth in Western science that was creeping up through uh, the world and uh, we are going to trace its uh, origins and spread, which is a very limited vision of the human past. It was a cultural and scientific history. When did the truth emerge? Uh, it reflects a, a tradition that a man named Sarton had translated to the United States, uh, his history of science. And the thought was that everybody would agree that science is science and it's true, isn't it? Uh, this, I think, is a very imperfect picture of human interaction. And uh, so I don't think it is a very good book to be quite a series of essays, I should say. What, shall I say oh, more about you, that, that UNESCO history? No, I think the point's clear. <laughs> okay, your, may I ask your final question? Yeah, maybe another question. Uh, in the rise of the West, you uh, explained in, I think, an outstanding way the amazing similarities between Mahayana Buddhism and uh, the origi origin of Christianity, two major religions that appeared on the same time in world history. As far as I know, you are one of the few who wrote about it so extensively. And to your opinion, these similarities are due to their common Hellenistic background. Mm -hmm. I have three, th three questions about it. Was this theory your own idea, or did you, do you have uh, sources that you didn't mention in the book? That's one question. You may say yes or no. <laughs> <laughs> Is it my own idea? The answer, I'm afraid, is yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Second question. <laughs> have you wrote about the subject uh, later on? Or do you have plans? I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Uh, have you elaborated on the theme later on? No, or, no, 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 no. Why? It's so an outstanding uh, theory. Uh -huh. Did you have uh, had responses on it? Well, when, when one says, one makes a, that kind of leap in the dark, that is, that observation of a certain convergence and can there not be a common uh, ancestor, a common stimulus. Uh, I think it's best to leave the field to experts. And experts haven't chosen to respond. There are many, many things in the rise of the West which experts have never looked at. Many, I had many things. I had, uh, I, I'm, I'm a theologian and I had uh, similar ideas, uh -huh. but I discovered that uh, Budalo, Budalo, uh, uh, Buddhist uh, uh, so, uh, so well, are, are not uh, the, the, the biggest proposition which I felt has ought to be looked at by people who really know is the assertion that I made, the suggestion that I made that inspiration takes two diverse forms, that visual as against auditory encounter with God, and that the visual perhaps comes out of India the auditory comes out of the Semitic prophetic tradition. And if you look at Christian uh, mystics, they saw God, they didn't hear God. The Jewish prophets heard God and didn't see God. Now that looks to me like a significant bifurcation. And no historian of religion of whom I am aware has looked at that question and said, is that man talking through his hat, or is it really so? I think this and is a this is a theory, this is a question that would be very much worth your investigating if you're willing to try. <laughs> and I like it you pose it in a church. <laughs> yes. Um, may I here draw the line, thanking um, you for your questions and contributions to the debate, but in the first place. Um, most heartily thanking Professor McNeil for his uh, contribution to this evening. Um, just like the proof of the pudding is in the eating, the most convi convincing argument of the world historian is his amazing competence over so many facets of the world's history. Thank you very much. <laughs>
just one quick word. Thank you, Professor McNeil. Thank you, Michael Zeeman and Professor Goudsblom. You enriched us with your knowledge, giving us patterns and structures in world history.